you've heard about my background a bit. Uh, there's one other piece to it. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years in Europe restructuring large European companies, uh, mostly French ones, uh, which is why I'm bold. Uh, and if you've interacted with French organizations, you probably understand that. And I noticed that all of our organizations, uh, large organizations, really resist change. And I use that analogy of the, of the immune system. When I got to Singularity, and I, when, I was at, when I was at Yahoo um, a, a few years ago, I was the, while Jerry Yang was CEO, I was building out their incubator, uh, and I noticed that this immune system problem was happening, right? And this is a fundamental structural issue. It's not that big, large companies are bad. It's just that they're all built to withstand risk and withstand change. And this is a fundamental problem that we have. I noticed that three months into my role at Yahoo, which was the interface to the outside world, I'd lost touch with the startup community. Because my head's down, I, you're so heads down pounding corridors trying to get stuff done that you lose that contact. And you may find this surprising, but if you go to talk to the average Google engineer, which is five minutes away from where we are at, at, at NASA, they know very little about these technologies, but they're all heads down getting stuff done, right? And so if you're finding some of what you've heard over this last couple of days surprising, don't be, just because it's really hard to keep pace with this pace of change. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing that happened was as we were building out Singularity, uh, in, the, in our summer we have 300 hours of lectures delivered by 160 speakers uh, over the course of that 10 weeks. Uh, we have um, about 140, 150 people room and board over the course of the summer. As we finished that first summer, um, uh, we had a visit from the, the dean of the, one of the largest business schools in the world, and our, maybe the best one. And he set, came along and he had like a bunch of newspapers with articles about SU circled, and he put them down and he said, look, what are you doing here? Um, there's about $2 million worth of PR here. I, I'm the best business school in the world. I can't buy an article in a newspaper. So he tried to explain the model. Um, and after a few minutes, he's to totally puzzled look in his eyes. He's trying to understand it. And he said, how big is your team? And we looked around the table, and there was like five of us, and I said, well, that's it. And his mind broke. Like, literally, you could see him just leave the building. He couldn't conceive. He said, my personal staff at my office is 12 people. How have you done this? And it really struck me that how, it wasn't that we were that great, but the tools that were available to us, Google Docs and file sharing, activity streams, collaboration, real-time updates, were stuff that allowed us to leverage our capability very, very strongly. So that was the start of this. Uh, and over the next year or so, I was looking at these organizations. There's a new breed of organization structure that's creating a massive impact with a very small footprint. And it was actually Paul Safo, one of our faculty, who's a futures and forecasting expert, who said to me, hey, you should write a book on this. And, and, and he actually suggested the term uh, exponential organizations. So we've talked about how we are digitizing the world. We've talked about how disruptive that is. I've talked through the, the camera analogy that I've given you when we turn something from a material world to a digital world, how dramatic that is. Um, I've also, when, of course, once you have something in a digital environment, you can apply machine learning and Jeremy Howard takes over and goes crazy with it, runs algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. That drives the pace of change even faster, right? Um, and all, this is now happening across all of these technologies, as we mentioned. Um, and this is my favorite chart that we've seen recently. This is from Saul Griffith, one of our faculty. He's a MacArthur genius. This is, if you're in material science of any kind, uh, this is Hooke's law, stress versus strain. And whenever we project and estimate stress versus strain, we use Hooke's law to do it, which is that purple little bit at the bottom. Um, we have been using Hooke's law for 350 years to project stress versus strain. And now, because of computation, just in the last few years, we can go into the green bit. Right? That whole area is now available to us because we can model it because of the computational power that we have at hand. And I think that really hits uh, home how, where we've been and where we can now go in terms of how we manage materials. And that's essentially the same paradigm shift that we've talked about. And you heard from Mark how, how fundamentally difficult we have in dealing with this uh, paradigm. So this is my, uh, you've seen kind of the polite versions of the video of the Google car, et cetera. And you all kind of freaked out a bit at Mark's talk, right? How, anybody freak out a little bit unnerving? All right, this is what it's like to ride in the Google car for the first time. Let me, let's just play this video. Oh my god, go is the right word. Holy shit. There's a little swearing in this, it's Holy YouTube, shit. so I have to ignore this. Hands on that wheel. Oh my god. What? <laughs> okay. 
you get the general idea. Um, that is the visceral scream of humanity meeting advanced technology, right? And the first time you get into that car and it takes off at high speed through that obstacle course and is driving it faster than you could drive it yourself, and there's nobody in the driver's seat, you freak out. And what we're seeing around the world today is the world is freaking out based because of this information paradigm. The Arab Spring is one example. The younger generation is leveraging information in the way that the older generation can't conceive of. Uh, our, uh, our discussion around Edward Snowden, the same thing. We're trying to use old efforts to, to attack new efforts. And you heard the regulatory discussion. So we've got that whole discussion going on on the management of society side. Um, and we have a huge issue also for businesses because as we disrupt and we information enable, we also have a huge demonetization impact. I've talked through earlier in, in the casual comments what's happening in the newspaper industry, the music business. Uh, this is Netflix versus blockbusters, uh, streaming versus rentals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how deceptive this is, right? And what we try and teach people is spot that doubling pattern because it will come and bite you if you're not careful about it. The last piece of this, which is what's driving this new wave of businesses, is really the democratization. Because these technologies are so cheap, any single individual can go do something dramatic with it. Right? This is Emiliano Cargimin, is one of our faculty, one of our students, our alumni from our summer program. He's been voted by our faculty the most likely to actually impact a billion people. Um, he is launching a mesh network of satellites that will deliver real-time video, nano satellites about this big. They will deliver real-time video anywhere on Earth to about a one-meter resolution. Okay? Skybox that just got bought by Google does it to about a five to six-meter resolution. One guy with a small team is doing this. Think about what, the, and his total cost for doing this will be about $200 million. Right? Compare that to the billions spent on Iridium, Global Star, et cetera. His first two satellites have already launched, so he's well on his way. Right? Um, I, we've talked about me, uh, neuroscience. You heard from Daniel Kraft, some of the sensors that are available, these $100 headsets that give you a pretty good sense of what's happening. On the left is a, in the silhouette is me with a, with a headset. That's a readout from my brain. On the right is one of our other alumni, Will Henshaw. He was a guitarist for the Eurythmics, the band from the 1980s. What Will is doing, he's composing music that when you play the music, it puts your, he it puts your head into a focused state. You're in the zone. You can get work done. So if you're coding, if you're working on a spreadsheet, PowerPoint, et cetera. It's anti-distraction music. Uh, and you can see this is me before and after I play the music. And you can see my brain is flooded with alpha waves, which is the freak brainwave frequency you want. Now, this is a pretty massive idea. Right? He's getting five hours per website visit per user average. Right? Unbelievable. Um, and it works. The leading expert in ADHD has said this is better than any of the drugs that he's ever given any of the kids because it just puts them into one focused area. And so this is extraordinary. Now, if you're Red Bull, you should be a little worried about this, right? And you won't see this coming. This is an orthogonal impact on your marketplace. It's not a direct competition. If you're Starbucks, you should be worried about this, right? And so what's going to have start to happen is small upstarts like this or Emiliano are going to start disrupting major industries from the side. And this is the dynamic that we're into now. And the question really is, how do we organize for this? Um, so I, I talked about uh, Yahoo, I talked about that whole uh, thing. I think it's important to do an incubator, but you have to keep it stealth and it has to report to the CEO. For God's sakes, don't have a report to the CFO or anybody else, but, but definitely the CEO, right? Um, and we're seeing now this new breed of organization that is actually turning the model inside out. If you look at how we build organizations, we take a, 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 a workforce or an asset, we put a legal organizational boundary around it, and we sell access and we sell that scarcity. Right? We're operating off a scarcity model and we're selling access to it. A beachfront hotel property, a restaurant with a great chef, etc. These new organizations, rather than trying to own this asset or workforce, are turning the model inside out and tapping into and convening uh, value rather than trying to own it. Right? Um, uh, some of these examples you'll hear a little bit from uh, Jay Rogers at Local Motors, but how many, many of you are familiar with Quirky? Can I just see your show of hands? Right? So if you're uh, in the CPG space, consumer packaged goods like Procter & Gamble, it takes you about 300 days to get from a new idea to product on a Walmart shelf. Quirky, same industry, goes from new idea to a product on a Walmart shelf in 29 days. And the benchmark that I found of these new organizations, we've now identified about 30 or 40 of them, uh, is that they're getting about a 10x performance benchmark benefit compared to their peers, which is kind of amazing, just by the way they organize themselves. 
right? Um, Kaggle, we've talked about how they leverage the data science uh, social network of data scientists or top coder and so on. There's a whole list of these. Maybe the most interesting, uh, TED is an example, right? A nice high-end conference, about 1,000 attendees. Chris Anderson takes it over, releases, use, leverages rich media, turns to the community, says anybody can go create a TEDx event. Uh, in four years, a global media brand. Right? Nobody's ever created a global media brand in four years, and boom, here we are. Right? And cost of doing that, pretty much zero, just by leveraging and harnessing the community. And maybe the most extreme example that's in the news a lot right now is Airbnb, um, where they're expanding and scaling at extraordinary levels. At the current pace of Airbnb's growth, that purple chart, this chart is two years old. And that tweet, I found that tweet, it's 18 months old. At the time, it was valued at about $4 billion. Um, sorry, valued at $2.5 billion. Who knows what it is today? 18 billion, okay? Unbelievable in 18 months, right? And look at the room nights. Does that curve look familiar after this last couple of days? It should. In 15 months at its current pace, Airbnb will be the biggest hotelier in the world. Now, if you're Hyatt, you have 45,000 employees. Uh, you're valued less than Airbnb today. Airbnb has 160 employees. This is unbelievable what we're seeing today. So how do you do this? Uh, and now we're seeing that same model, a collaborative consumption model across all of these different sectors. And, uh, but maybe a dozen competitors in each of these. Jeremiah Ouyang's Crowd Companies uh, website lists a lot of this uh, type of stuff. And here are some of the attributes, and I'm gonna go through this in a little more detail, so don't, uh, we can go through this. But we've got a formula for what it is, does it take to create an EXO, an exponential organization. So the first is, um, you have all of these uh, EXOs have a massive transformative purpose. Okay? This is not a standard mission statement. So, for example, uh, Google, organize the world's information, right? Singularity, go impact a billion people. Uh, uh, XPRIZE, go radical breakthroughs to benefit humanity. Highly aspirational, uh, creates power of pull, uh, as John Hagel puts it, draws the community into you. Your community gets excited about it, pulls your products out of you almost, like they do with Apple. Right? Extraordinary outcomes to seeing there. The, here's an example of a weak purpose, kind of a standard mission statement, shaping the future of the internet, creating unprecedented value for customers, subscribers, da, 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 da. How many of you have a mission statement like this? Nobody's putting up their hands. Yeah. So now, who is this? Anybody know? It's Cisco. What if they said, connect everyone everywhere all the time? That would be kind of cool. That would be an exciting company to work for, right? I predict one of the things we'll start seeing is brands will start morphing towards big transformative purposes. Okay? Um, and I mentioned why we have this. The second element of this is five externalities to scale. Um, five kind of levers you can pull to scale your company outside your own organizational boundaries. The first is staff on demand. You don't try and own your own employees. You borrow them, rent them, uh, get the crowd, get the community excited. Second, of course, is community and crowd like Air, uh, TED is doing, or other websites, Twitter, et cetera. Um, third, algorithms. Google may be the grandfather of this, leveraging algorithms in a very heavy way uh, to really scale or outside. Um, Airbnb, a big chunk of their success is the algorithm by which they show you what properties are available near you with high ratings that, you, that tailor to your preferences and so on. Um, fourth, similar to assets on demand, uh, uh, staff on demand, assets on demand, right? If you have a lot of physical assets or workforce, you have to spend a lot of time managing it, controlling it, et cetera, much harder. If you have a flexible crowd, it's also hard to manage, but it's easier and gives you adaptability. And the fifth is engagement. What do we mean by engagement is gamification, uh, Peter's expertise, incentive prizes. We've found that gamification is really good at, at keeping your community engaged. Um, leaderboards, uh, uh, points, et cetera. Uh, incentive prizes are really great for turning crowd into community, right? And so we're seeing mechanisms for each of these uh, in this. Um, the, uh, the second part of this is five attributes that go to the acronym IDEAS, which is how do you manage these? Uh, how do you manage these externalities, right? How do you control them, et cetera? Uh, interfaces. Uber has very special interfaces by which it manages its drivers. Right? TEDx has very specific rules for how you create a TEDx event that are on 
very narrow rails. Um, Kaggle has very specific ways of managing its 120,000 data scientists or however many they have on the platform. It actually forms a kind of intellectual property, this unique ability to manage this group outside, managing these externalities. The second part of this is dashboards, live metrics, right? live analytics as to what's going on. Will Henshaw, as he's tracking focus at will, which, by the way, is kind of a freemium site. It costs about 30 bucks for a pro account to listen to that all, uh, the whole time around. The book's been written kind of on it that I'll mention in a second. Uh, the, this whole idea of dashboards is live tracking of your business on the outside and on the inside to manage employees in a hyper-growth environment. We found the best model are what's called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter all use this model uh, to manage uh, this capability and manage and track your teams. The third is, of course, experimentation. This is well known as the lean uh, methodology, uh, constantly testing. If your outside environment is so volatile, you constantly need to adapt your processes and continuously test your assumptions as to what's happening in the outside world, uh, taking risk, uh, uh, testing, iterating, constantly learning. Fourth, autonomy. Very decentralized mechanisms for, for pushing authority out to the edges so that employees, partners, vendors, suppliers can see what's happening at the edges and do it. And the fifth, of course, social. Real-time activity streams, file sharing, et cetera, to keep the, what Gartner calls a zero latency enterprise. What we found is if you implement four out of those 10, four out of those 10, you get to the 10x level. Right? Some companies are employing nine or 10 or 11, and they get actually much bigger benefits. But if you employ four out of the 10, you get to that. So the book, the first half of the book, uh, is what is this animal? And what are the characteristics? And we go into a little bit of detail around it. The second half is what do you do about it? Right? How do you implement it? How do you build a startup with these principles in mind? Um, how do you apply this to a mid-market company? And the part that I'll go through now is what do you do if you're a large organization? Right? And I thought because we have uh, lots of large organizations represented, I would go through what we mean by this. The first piece of advice for large organizations, your leadership and your board needs to be aware of this. Right? And we talked through that stat for the, that we do with Deloitte with the Innovation Partners Program. Uh, most companies have very little awareness of these breakthroughs, most uh, C-suite execs. But afterwards, 80% of them uh, see an 80% uh, chance of major disruption within two years in their industries. Right? That's a pretty huge number. So educating the senior leadership, and not just the leadership, but the board. The board has to give the CEO cover to navigate this new world. The second is you cannot take a big traditional organization and turn it into an exponential organization. It's too radical a change. And it's a mistake we see lots of organizations trying to make. What you do is you take the disruptive change makers inside all of your organizations, and we have quite a few here in the room I can see, and you take them to the edges of your organization and let them build them off the edges of your organization. Right? Uh, John Hegel from, uh, uh, from the Center from the Edge from Deloitte calls this taking the edge, scaling edges, right? And it has a whole workshop. So you go to the edge and you scale something off yourself in this way. Uh, Apple does this very well. They take a small team, they take them to the edge, and they go attack a totally different marketplace using their core competency of design. The third uh, is that you have to, in each of your industries, uh, I mentioned Quirky in the CPG industry. Quirky is a pretty... Uh, the CPG world is pretty old. It's, it's a pretty traditional industry. Uh, uh, one of the studies we saw saw 80 disruptive startups in the consumer packaged goods industry. Right? Marcus Shingles is here in the room somewhere. Um, one of our, our partners that we work with at Deloitte. 80 disruptive startups in this old world. And he found that the leading uh, uh, companies in that space, like Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, et cetera, et cetera, the top three or four, had found all 80 and partnered with the top 30. The rest of them didn't even know they existed, right? And in the world where startups are going to be the disruptors, if you're a large organization, you had better find those organizations and buy them, acquire them, partner with them, copy, copy them, invest in them, do whatever, but figure out what they're doing uh, because they will eat your lunch if otherwise, right? Or get acquired by the people that then will eat your lunch. Um, the fifth, the, the fifth is, is find the data that you have in your organization and expose it to the outside world via APIs, et cetera. If you're a bank, the amount of insights you could do, you could provide with machine learning and others is quite extraordinary. Uh, this is the uh, partnership idea. GE looked at Quirky and that time to market, 29 days to go from an idea 
to a Walmart shelf, right? Kind of unbelievable. And they said, we can't compete with that. And so they partnered with them for six months, and then they led a major investment round into Quirky, right? Uh, fifth one, exposed data. Turn your uh, model into a data-oriented model. The financial world has done that quite well. Rolls-Royce used to sell engines and then lease engines. Uh, then they were leasing by the hour, and now they're a big data company because they're tracking each of their engines and then selling the intelligence back to the airlines as to how to have more optimal routes. Okay? Uh, fifth, second last one, Mark referenced this. If you've got a security team, you need to have, he calls it a red ops team, you need to have a team attack yourself to see what flaws you might have. But in the same way, you need to actually hire, go find five smart 20-something roles and set, pay them to set up a company to disrupt you. Because either you're doing that or somebody else is. Right? Ideal, the design firm, did this. They found that their, open, their model, their, their kind of intellectual property, their methodology for design had been, was, was well understood enough that they're losing their advantage. They actually paid a team to go disrupt them. The result was a platform called Open Ideal, where you can, a, a marketplace for design ideas. And the last one is set up a Google X equivalent. Uh, Larry Page, a couple of years ago at a Singularity event, said to me, hey, Brickhouse was kind of cool. Should we do that at Google? And I said, no, you'll evoke the same kind of response. But do something like that, but I would point it elsewhere. Right? And he took it two steps further. They've added the moonshots idea. And so what they do is they've got a, their standard capability of managing information. They take very disruptive technologies, autonomous cars, Google Glass, et cetera, and they go attack other marketplaces with it. And create whole new markets using kind of a blue ocean strategy. That's our suggestions for large organizations as to how to deal with this. We found some really interesting, surprising case studies around this. We found a company called Valve. How many of you are familiar with Valve software? So Valve is a software company out of Seattle, 400 people. Uh, they have no CEO, no reporting lines, no job descriptions, no management layers, no meetings of any kind. They operate like a beehive mentality. You join as a self-starter. If you like a team, you go work with them. They get more revenue per employee than Microsoft. Right? Kind of amazing that you could do this. And we thought, okay, and then you may be familiar with, be familiar with Zappos, the e-commerce company. Zappos is implementing this model. They're stripping out all the management layers uh, and going fully autonomous, letting anybody decide what their job, the people decide their own job descriptions. And they have a whole bill of rights that they use. And we found, okay, this works for cute Seattle, Seattle companies, gaming companies, or Silicon Valley companies, but it wouldn't work for a real operational company. And then we found ING Direct, an online bank in Canada. This is the Canadian version of the online bank, where the CEO did this. No management meetings, no reporting lines, no CEO, no job description. If they do a promotion, uh, everybody swarms to the phone banks. When it's regular reporting time, everybody goes to the reporting systems. And so you have multidisciplinary teams operating in conjunction. A normal bank in Canada manages about 10,000 in deposits per employee. They're managing 40,000 in deposits per employee just from that one element, right? Because the communications abilities we have today and the sharing and the collaborative technologies via the internet allow us to operate in this new way and achieve extraordinary benefits as a result. Um, Amazon has done something interesting. It's really easy in a big company to say no, right? So Amazon's done something that they call the institutional yes. The idea is that if you come up to me with a great, an idea and you're working on my team, my default answer to your, your idea has to be yes. If I want to say no, I have to write a two-page thesis of why it's a bad idea and post it publicly. So they've created friction to saying no, right? Pretty cool idea to how to overcome the natural inclination in big companies. Google has taken the OKR methodology and taken it a whole step further, and they made it transparent inside the whole organization. So I can look up, if I'm a Google employee, look up any other member or team and look at their objectives and their past performance. It's fully transparent. Enormously courageous act. Uh, there was a Wall Street firm that tried to do this and said, let's make this whole thing open. And it was a total disaster because the culture is so competitive that people started ripping each other to shreds and they had to stop it. Right? So we found a negative example of that. Um, uh, I'll pick one more. Uh, Hershey's actually now calls themselves the knowledge company not a candy store. They call themselves a the knowledge company. Kind of cool. We found some interesting examples of the massive transformative purpose. Coke's new mantra is open happiness. Right? So we're seeing more and more brands move to this new model. Um, and the announcement that we're making here, uh, and I'd like to point out a couple of people here, 
is uh, we've spent three years researching this. We've looked at uh, Yuri Van Gies, can you just stand up and raise your hand? Yuri's uh, one of my co-authors on this. Uh, another one is Mike Malone, who uh, is kind of the writer of record in Silicon Valley. He wrote the virtual corporation back in the day and so on. Uh, and we've been looking at this for three years now. We've looked at about uh, 200 or so different organizations and we've scored them. We actually came up with a diagnostic survey uh, to say how exponential is your organization. If you go to the website, which is exponentialorgs.com, uh, you can actually take the survey, you can see that in the second tab here. What we're announcing today is the book is ready for pre-order. General release will be in three months. Thank you very much. Um, um, it's one of those where either I'm, uh, my wife will kill me, Lily's sitting right there, or I'll get the damn book out. It's, it's a, been a very fascinating and interesting process to go through this. And it's been unbelievable to see how we've been migrating this. And so what we're going to see now is a whole new wave of these new organizations. We think that as we go forward, you will have to compete with these types of organizations. We think this is a new model for how organizations will be built in the future. As I mentioned, the first half is the kind of analysis of what is it. The second half is the kind of how-to side. Uh, Peter has contributed a lot of effort, and so has uh, the, Silica the Singularity University faculty who've given ideas as to how to think about this. Here's the kind of killer idea behind this, the economic basis of these new organizational models. When you're running a business or building a business, you're worried about how do you manage cost of demand and you're worried about how do you manage cost of supply, right? And we try and optimize around both as, as much as we can. What the internet did for the first time was it helped us drop the cost of demand exponentially. Online marketing, referral marketing, and so on. If you get to a viral loop, your actual demand cost goes straight to zero. Pretty cool. What these new exponential organizations are doing is they're dropping the cost of supply exponentially, either by leveraging the crowd or by leveraging accelerating technologies or a combination, they're dropping the cost. So our Airbnb has no marginal cost, almost zero marginal cost to add another hotel room. Waze, the traffic application that uses your own GPS as a sensing point, when they get a new user, it hits supply and demand. And so when you can have no very low cost of supply and very low cost of demand, the business explodes. That's why we're seeing this extraordinary performance that we're seeing. And I think this will be the new wave as to how to compete. The question then is, as you're building a new organization, how do you build it with marginal cost of supply being very, very low? And if you're a large organization, how do you drop your cost of supply very dramatically? And they're doing that by leveraging information and so on. Uh, very thrilled to hear, I was talking to our friends at Deloitte, uh, they are now going to use this exponential score on the survey, which gives you a diagnostic, and they're going to score all of their clients with it uh, and give us the results uh, back from that. So very thrilled to see that happen, and we'll be working with them to get that out the door. So that's our perception on how we organize for this new world. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.